trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never sound retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with the glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free while God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching. soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before Christ our royal master leads against the foe forward into battle see his banner go Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. At the sign of triumph, Satan's host of flee. On then, Christian soldiers, on to victory hell's foundations quiver at the shout of praise brothers lift your voices loud your anthem raise onward christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of jesus going on before onward then ye people join our happy throng blend with our sure voices in the triumph song glory lord and honor unto christ the king this through countless ages men and angels sing onward christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of jesus going on
Bibles, if you would please, to the book of Ephesians. Now, I know, book of Ephesians, chapter number 6. I know that Dave is doing Ephesians on Sunday night, and he's doing a really good job. I really appreciate what he's been saying. The Lord's led me in, in, a, in a direction to uh, talk a little bit more about soldiers. Okay, Scripture shows us that God's people had enemies and that he helped them in their struggle against them. We're specifically going to be looking today at uh, verse number 10 down through verse uh, number 12 and maybe a few other verses in there too, but I want to draw your attention to those verses. Okay? Now, this is not an attempt to serve the Lord it's, so much, it's just an encouragement to protect ourselves. We are in a battle. Would you not all agree? And that battle, of course, is laid out for us right here. It's not against the, each other. It's against the devil. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about him. I want to spend time, more time talking about the Lord than I would about the other. But folks, let me tell you something. You and I both know that Jesus Christ is coming again soon. Would you not agree with that? I mean, it could be today, it might be tomorrow, but we know he's coming and we know it's soon. Okay, all we've got to do is look around and see what's going on around us. But today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the armor of God. But before we get there, I want to remind you of some things. Now, God wants us to become spiritual soldiers in his army. In Paul's fourth epistle that was written around 56 AD to the Corinthians, the second book that he wrote, Paul maintains in second, you're taking notes, you might write this verse down. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, he tells us there, he said, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For our, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. He further asserts in his first epistle to Timothy, when he says, and that's written about 64 A.D. Uh, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, he says this, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Now, if we were not in a warfare, why would Paul say that? See, it was going on then, and it's going on today. It was just as bad then as it is today. Because if you recall, Rome was in power. And they're a far worse government than what we have today. So just remember that, okay? This is something that's an ongoing thing. And then he goes on and said, Holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. Remember, we're in a battle and Satan wants to defeat you. And if he can, if he, can he will. Okay? We have got to be strong so that he won't. Okay? And then he goes on and he gives us an example. He says, of whom is Hymenus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So we need to remember this caveat that uh, the Apostle Paul gave to Timothy. And then probably in his last book, written about 64 or 67 A.D., to his son in the ministry, Timothy, Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. 
That's pretty poignant words, would you not say? Then he goes on, he said, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be, to become a soldier. That's what God wants for all of us, to become a good soldier, okay? So that we can stand against the wiles of the devil. So that we can, when we need to, flee youthful lusts, but, but that we can be strong in the Lord. That's what we need, every one of us. These petty things that are all around us, listen, folks, that battle is not here. That battle is spiritual battle. And we need to stand against the wiles of the devil. There's where the battle is. But he wants us not to fight him. He wants us to fight each other. And that's what we've got to guard against that. Okay? Now, uh, the psalmist David, and this is not just a New Testament thing. The psalmist David even stated in, in uh, Psalm 1834, He, God, teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken or bent by my arm, ready to knock, notch a, an arrow in the string and pull it back and go to battle. We need to be ready to go to battle. But we can't do it. I remember one foolish man saying a long time ago, I'm, I'm ready to charge hell with a squirt gun. And you know, that was a very foolish statement to make because our enemy is very strong. And we can't discount that. But greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Amen? So I look at the fact that God is stronger than I am, and he's much more stronger than the devil, but he wants to use me and you, all of us, in his army. So I want you to remember now, we're going to look at some things today, and I've entitled this message, God's Armor Provides Strength. God's Armor Provides Strength. Now, the source of this strength, of course, we read in Ephesians chapter number 6, when he says in verses 10 through 12, and, and you can read that silently as I read it aloud, Finally, my brethren, be, and I state it again, be strong, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not. Listen, this is what he's saying to us. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Thus saith the Lord. The battle's not here. The battle is 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 with Satan. And he, we need to understand, I cannot overemphasize that, that we need to stand strong and be strong. And then he goes on and he says, he says that, uh, well, let's, let's just read it again. We wrestle not, I state it again, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness, of this, wor uh, of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, where does Satan usually operate? Here. Here. But I want you to know he has access to heaven. You remember the book of Job? Satan walked up and stood in the throne room of God and spoke to God and he said, Have you considered your servant Job? Okay. And then he, God says, yeah, I, I have considered him. And he said, he said then at that particular point in time, okay, that's fine. Take away all of, all of this stuff and he'll curse you. So God says, I'll put that in your power to do. But, he said, you can't take his life. So you all know the story, don't you? Okay, Job lost everything. He lost his wealth. He lost his health, he lost his family, all of them, except his wife. 
but he lost her respect because she said, just curse God and die. You remember? She lost all of her kids. And here's Job, he's serving the Lord. And she says to him, she said, oh, just curse God and die. She had to pay a price for that, you know. But listen, what is happening in our lives and our world today has been prophesied for hundreds of years. It's nothing new. And God is telling us, be strong. Be strong. And I'm stating to you by the authority of the word of God, be strong. We need to be strong. We need to be stronger and grow stronger. Because we're all human, aren't we? Is there anybody here that doesn't make mistakes? I hear some little twitters, you know. <laughs> we know the answer to that. Every one of us blows it. Don't we? I'm, I'm, I'm probably the biggest one of all. But still, God still loves you. He cares for you. He loves you more than you love yourself. But he goes on. He says, we have this need for spiritual strength. He says that we, we need to stand, for, stand against what? The wiles of the devil. You know what the word wiles means? Okay, you know, you ever heard of wily coyote? Okay, you know, uh, what is it? Roadrunner. That's one of my. My wife hates it. She just doesn't like those Woody Woodpecker type stuff. But I love it. I I enjoy watching Roadrunner uh, be made a fool of, as it were. Okay. And uh, that coyote is something else. I, uh, I, well, I guess Roadrunner doesn't get, make, maybe, maybe Wiley Coyote is the one that is made a fool of. But none reg regardless of that, listen, you know what the word means? It means methods. It's the Greek word methodia. Methods. We all have methods. Now, <clears throat> I told somebody this morning, that me and kitchens don't get along, okay? Uh, if I try to boil water, I burn it. Seriously, I forget it. I cannot do anything. I, Kenny, I, see, I look out and I, I see you and I, I think, my goodness, how's the guy do it? But he does. He cooks up some fabulous stuff. Me and water don't get along, okay? But I want you to know some of his methods, and you know some of his methods, is lies, deceit, accusations, craftiness, trickery. That's what Satan does. Okay? Of course, we do too. Okay? I mean, we're human, so we, we do that. Now, uh, there's some other things that Satan does too. Uh, he blinds people via false doctrine. I turn on my radio or turn on my television, and I tell you what, I, see, I, I am appalled at some of the stuff that I hear and see. And some Christians buy into it. And I'm going, where's the knowledge of this book? Why in the world do we buy into stuff like this? If we know it's unbiblical. But we do it anyway. Not only that, he entices people to indulge in carnal desires. You know, one of the biggest industries in our world today is pornography. And people buy that stuff by the tons, wasting God's money on smut. But that's what Satan does to us. Amen. And we need to understand that, okay? 
But you see, we not only wrestle against spiritual wickedness in high places, we battle against principalities and powers. That's what the scriptures tell us. Rulers of the darkness of this age, huge amount of wickedness in high places. And it's getting worse. It's not getting better. Folks, I want you to know, Islam is probably one of the fastest growing religions in this world. And we need to understand they don't like Christians. We are their enemies. You know one of, one of the reasons why? And I've studied this out. They think we're polytheistic. We only believe in one God, don't we? But how many times have we said God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? To a Muslim, that's blasphemy. Do we believe in three gods? We believe in one God. And we believe that he manifests himself in three different ways. But it's one God, right? We believe that. But folks, they don't understand that because they hear us say God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So to them, we are saying there are three gods. Part of it, of their animosity toward us, is justified because they see the way we live our lifestyles here in this country and to them, we are just satanic. And you know something? Sometimes we are. So we've got to bear part of the responsibility. But understand, the battle still continues. And we must be strong in the Lord. We must be. Now, the nature of this strength, and there are seven articles here that I want to point out to you. You're familiar with them, so we don't have to spend a lot of time with it. But I want to draw your attention to the fact of the, the truth behind all of these articles. All of them are tapped into faith. Faith cometh by what? And hearing by? So, folks, how much of this is tied into this book and to everything that God has said to us? Everything is tied into that. And so let's notice here in this passage of Scripture. Well, it tells us, he says, well, I'm going to read verse number 13 real quick. Wherefore, take unto you the whole, not part, but the whole, okay? We need to read every word and not gloss over them. We do that too much. And we leave a lot of stuff out that we need to pay, pay attention to. But he says right here, wherefore, take unto you. So what does that mean? That means that, Part of this responsibility is mine. God has it there, but i got to put it on. I have to take it. I have to pick it up and literally put it on, okay? He says, the wherefore, take unto you the whole, not part again, the whole armor of God that you may be able to kneel. Is that what it says? No. That you might be able to lie down. Is that what it says? Now, what does it say? Withstand. We need to read the word and understand what it's saying to us. Okay? We need to withstand in the evil day. What evil day? Folks, I'm telling you, this is an evil day. Tomorrow's an evil day. Yesterday was an evil day. And the, this next week's going to be evil. Until Jesus comes, it's not going to get any better. And we need to understand that. The scriptures withstand an evil day and having done all to what? To stand. I was saved when I was nine years old. And I got away from the Lord very quickly. And I'm not going to go into the reason for that. It's not germane to the issue. But I got back into the battle again when I was 19, 10 years later. And the battle was worse when I got back into it than when I'd left it in the first place. 
And I'm telling you, the battle's worse 50 years later. Okay? Now, verse 14 tells us, it said, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with what? Truth. What is truth? Anybody telling me? Thy word is truth. Yeah, Frank, that's right. Thy word is truth. Not about the word, but the word is truth. Too many times we hear things in the, on the radio or on television, or we see things on television about the word, not the word. We need the word. That's what we need today. Having your loins girt about with truth. Now, what's so important about the loins? That's the reproductive and the, I guess, the waste functions. We reproduce ourselves biblically through truth. We win people to the Lord by truth, not about truth, but the truth. Okay? Now, also, sometimes we don't get rid of the waste. But the only way we can get rid of waste is through truth. What truth? God's truth. You remember when Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? Remember, what is truth? Thy word is truth. That's what truth is. And he tells us to have our loins girt about. Listen to what I'm telling you, please. This is important. Okay? Get your loins, my loins, all of us. Get our, have truth around us. Not lies. Too much too much lies. And then it goes on. It serves like a belt. Now, the breastplate, it goes on. And in verse, uh, verse 14 again, and having the what? The breastplate of righteousness. Now, where do we get righteousness? Where do we even learn about righteousness? From truth, right? Not self-righteousness. I'm not saying, you know, you've seen them. You've seen people walk around and say, boy, I'm, I'm so glad. God's so great to have me. You ever seen people like that? You know, you just know that's their whole thing. You know, aren't you lucky? I get to be here with you. That's the attitude. And you kind of want to go, ah, gag a maggot, you know. This whole thing, I, I don't know, come on. This is ridiculous. God tells us, don't esteem yourselves more highly than you ought, but esteem others. That's what the scriptures tell us. What is that? That's truth. Not about truth. I've read Gary Smalley and I've read a whole lot of other people. Okay? Jay Adams and all kinds of stuff. I'm telling you something. Some of it is truth and some of it is garbage. This is the only thing that will sustain you, this book. And I stand on the validity of that statement. And I don't back off of it. Listen, breastplate of whose righteousness? Ours? No, whose righteousness? His righteousness. Okay? I have no righteousness. All of my righteousness, according to the scripture, is as what? Filthy rags. Exactly right. Let me tell you something. Who, who died and made us God? Okay? We need to be in the book. And we need to be studying the book. And we need to be putting the truth of the word of God in us. And on us. That's our job to do that. Okay? And then, not only that, the gospel of peace. Okay. Now, having your feet shod with the gospel of peace. You ever looked at your feet? You ever looked at them? 
I think it's the ugliest part of a body, frankly. Okay? I, I do. I, I look at that and say, you yuck. But Romans tells us how beautiful are, are, are the feet of those that bring the gospel of peace. That's what it says. Okay? So I look at my feet and say, well, I might think they're lo- uh, ugly, but if I carry the gospel of peace like God wants me to, if I shod my feet like God wants me to shod it, then you know what? They're not so ugly. My view is not important. By the way, I tried to get in the Navy. How many people here went in the Navy? Carl, who else? You know what? Those turkeys wouldn't take me. I thought, how lucky you are to have me. (laughs) I'm certainly joking. But understand this. They wouldn't take me because I have flat feet. I thought, what in the world? What difference does that make? Flat feet. My goodness, because I can't stand on the deck of a ship, maybe? I don't know, maybe because I can't march? Well, who's going to march in the Navy? Did you do any marching in the Navy, Carl? Not after boot camp? You just tried to stand on the deck of a ship, right? Okay. But I'm, I'm going to tell you, I, 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 they wouldn't take me. I, I just couldn't believe it. I thought, man, oh, man, what am I going to do? Looks like I'm, I'm up for the draft. Well, that wasn't going to happen. So I enlisted in the Air Force, and they were stupid enough to take me. Okay. And I spent four years packing parachutes and life rafts and life preservers and stuff like that. I was so bad they wouldn't even take me to Vietnam. Had two sets of orders but didn't have to go. But I tell you what, a lot of guys did. And a lot of them didn't make it back. But I do remember some of the reactions of the public on me and others. I do remember. How many of you guys remember that? We were baby killers. Remember? Remember how they spit on us? Remember? That doesn't happen now. Because America now has been attacked. And people don't like that. So now when I wear my Air Force hat, thank you for your service, is what I hear. Thank you for what you did for us, is what I hear. A little different. By the way, I look at the clock back there, and it says now it's 1230. I'm in trouble. Okay, actually not 1230, it's 1130, so we're good. Okay, I wish they'd do something about this daylight saving junk, don't you? But anyway, the gospel of peace, the gospel of God's power and the salvation, armed with the gospel we can have beautiful feet that is, enables us to take glad tidings to others. I don't know. Patty and I will be gone the Sunday that Brian is here. But I tell you what, if you want a blessing, make sure you're here on the 27th of, of November. Just make sure you're here. He's got a story to tell that, let me tell you, just thrill your soul. And, it, and I mean, the gospel around this world is, is it's not hindered at all. Well, yeah, it is a little bit. But, but we need to remember, they just keep pressing forward and keep on going, building churches, starting churches, getting people saved, getting them baptized. That's pretty awesome. But they do it because they have become strong in the Lord. That's the reason why. And then another thing, too. Uh, let's see. It says, your feet shod with the gospel of peace and above all, taking the shield of faith. Big shield. Shield of what? Hmm. Faith. Four times in Scripture God tells us that we're supposed the just shall live by faith. Four times. Do we? Do we live according to the principles set forth in this book? Do we live according to the commands that God gave us in this book? Do we do what we should be doing? Should be do we become what we should become. God wants us to be holy, are we? 
I ask myself all these questions. I want you to know before you start saying, no, 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 you shouldn't do that. I'll tell you there are three fingers pointing back at me because I'm guilty too. All of us are. And we're foolish when we say we're not. And we go on. And it says the, the, the uh, shield of faith. And then he says, he says, have a listen, shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the what? The fiery darts of the wicked. And verse 17 says, take the helmet of salvation. Why helmet? helmet? Where do you put a helmet? You don't put a helmet on your shoulder. You put a helmet on your head. Okay, this is where we think. This is where we know things, right here, in my head. Okay, I spent several years in school. Um, many of us went on. Rick, how, how long did you spend in school? A bunch, right? Can't even. Can't even. Okay, okay. Cam, how many? How long did you stay in school to to learn to be a nurse? You know. Three <laughs> A long time, right? Listen, you never get out of school. Never, okay? But up here, up here is where we learn things. What does First John chapter number 5 tell us about salvation? It says it's a no-so thing. I can know that I have salvation. Well, I think, I hope I'm saved. Wrong answer, okay? I don't have to, I, I don't have to hope. I can know based upon what this book tells me. I know for a fact that Jesus saved me. I know for a fact that he's coming again. When, I don't know, but I think it's soon. I know for a fact there's a heaven. Amen? Amen. I know for a fact there's a hell to shun. This book tells me that, Right? Okay, I know for a fact that God is powerful and God is greater than anything else in this world, right? That's what this tells me. Folks, I know this in my brain. And the helmet of salvation helps to sustain that in my brain. That way then I'm not ignorant of Satan's devices. I'm not stupid about things that are happening all around me. I'm not the ostrich with his head in the sand. I'm standing, looking around, realizing that I'm in a battle. And you need to do the same. And it's not going to get any better, sorry, until Jesus comes. Okay? And then there are two articles here. One of them is usually kind of skipped right over. But the scriptures tell us, the helmet of salvation, which is the word of God. Praying always. Let's see. Where, where is it? Oh, uh, verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword, that's offense, sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of, of the joints and marrow and of the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Scripture says that. We have a sword. We need to pick it up. And we need to use it. Okay? But I tell you what, it's two-edged. Okay? One edge is pretty sharp. We like to... Well, we like to think about that. Cuts out. But God wants us never to forget that it cuts us just as well. In preparing this message, folks, there are a lot of tears. A lot of tears. Thinking back of people that I know that are laying by the wayside. One man pastoring a church told his wife, pregnant with their child, you need to get in some firewood for the winter in New York because I'm leaving. Pastoring a church. People following this guy. He need to get in. His wife needs to get in some firewood. 
Well, I tell you what, I don't know any man worthy salt that would let his wife cut firewood. You? But that's what this guy who was a pastor of a church was doing. And then he left. Left her alone. Something's wrong with that picture. Somebody didn't have their armor on. Somebody allowed Satan to get in and defeat him. And he was the pastor of a church. I'll go on. I'm not even going to continue there. You can draw your own conclusion. But if it's you're like you, I got a little angry at that. Because I didn't think it was right. And I told him, I said, I don't think you're doing right. He said, I don't care what you think, I'm going to do it anyway. And he did. That's someone who should be clothed in the armor of God. Now, here's the first offensive weapon that we must use in battle. With this sword, it's possible for the Spirit to cut the heart of those who hear it and those who prepare and read it. But then notice, if you would, the next thing. Verse 18. Praying sometimes with all prayer. Whoop. Did I say it right? No. How did I mess up? Praying what? I'm glad you caught it. Kind of intended for you to catch it. I kind of do that. I, I, I enjoy doing stuff like that. But anyway, it says praying always with some prayer. Is that what it says? All prayer and supplication how? In the Spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Folks, I remember some of the last minutes that Jesus spent on this earth. Especially in the Garden of Gethsemane, remember? How he prayed and he shed, as it were, great drops of blood. That agony just before he was crucified the next day. You all remember that? And then he looked at his disciples and they were asleep. And he said to them, he said, what could you not watch with me one hour? One hour? You ever prayed for an hour? You ever been so burdened down with things that you get on your knees and you spend at least an hour, maybe two, on your knees in prayer. You ever done that? I think that's what God wants of us. I think He wants us to spend time in prayer. That's an offensive weapon. Because there's, there's some things that we need to understand about prayer. And it strengthens us in the battle. Okay? But I want to encourage you Please, please, please put this armor on. Now, i got to confess to you, and I'm winding it down. I fail to do that often. Anybody with me? We all have. I'm not looking for solace in the fact that you do too. I'm looking at the fact that I fail. I fail. I don't want to fail. Okay? There are consequences for failing. When I was in the Air Force, I can remember guys would go to sleep on the guard duty. There were consequences for that. Okay? I can remember all kinds of different things. I mean, well, where's so-and-so? Well, he's in the brig. Why? Because he broke this law or did this thing. That happened. It's the consequences. Folks, somebody might die and go to hell because we do not put on that armor. Somebody might fall. The friend that I just mentioned to you a second ago, he's still a friend. He didn't do right, but I look at him and I say, huh, but for the grace of God, there go I. You know? And I think, yeah, he didn't do right. 
but maybe I didn't do right in not praying for him. I did pray for him, but maybe I should have prayed harder. I fail. We all fail. Let's not be failures. Let's be strong in the Lord. Let's determine in our hearts that we're going to do what this tells us to do. Let's determine that we're going to allow God to give us his strength. Let's determine that we're going to put on the whole armor of God. Let's determine we're going to whatever, whatever the, is needed. Don't leave anything out. Let's put it all on. Let's remember that there's a world around us and there are people sitting right next to us. There are people in this world today. Where would they be without you? I love you. I do. It's not because I'm commanded to. It's because you're my brothers and sisters. It's because you're important. But we've got a much more important God that wants us to be strong in Him. I think I, we, we need to put on these seven pieces of armor. And thus armed, we are, according to Scripture, able to resist and stand firm against anything that Satan throws at us. Anything. But the choice is yours. Choice is mine. The choice is ours. What are we going to do? Are we going to? There's a song that was written several years ago. Are we walking into the enemy's camp, laying our armor down? Do we have God's armor on? We're in a battle. I don't know about you, but I sometimes feel like an unarmed man. Do you? You don't have to. This is truth. We can walk into the enemy's camp strong in the Lord. And by the way, I want to tell you, you are in the enemy's camp. And I want to remind you that God is here, but there's someone else here too. And He's telling you whispering in your ear various untruths. Get the armor on and don't let him do it. Because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Would you stand with me?